all the other work on the other two videos. This is a different barrel just so I could keep working. But we've got it thread, counterboard, uh, no flutes on this one so no need to time it. This one's getting chambered in 308 Winchester. Um, this is a Pacific Tool and Gauge match chambering reamer. We use floating pilots so it doesn't rub on the rifling. You can see that this one will turn. We can also change the pilot size out to, to better fit the bore diameter. We want it as tight as we can get it without it marking the top of the lands, but not loose enough to where it can float around in there and make the chamber oversized or make the throat crooked. Um, like I say, this, there's no voodoo to this, it's just a shaped cutter, um, shaped just like a 308 case with a bullet on it, and uh, we just take, keep cutting away until we get it down to the depth that we want, and we're going to start on that now. Okay, we got the reamer in the barrel, and we run just about as slow as the machine will go, in my case it's 70 RPM. We run in here by feel. pass, I go in the entire length of the throat, the entire length of the neck, and about halfway up the shoulder diameter. on the reamer so I can see if there's any vibration, which it generally turns into chatter. And also to see if the, the reamer moves around. Now what that tells me is that there, the bore is curved or um, we're into a new section that isn't concentric to the threads and then we make some adjustments there to get everything back in straight. But with good barrels and good equipment, that's usually not problem we have to worry about. And that is the very start of a chamber. Keep cleaning off the reamer and keep oiling it. Keep it chipped from getting built up in there and galling the inside of the chamber. And just keep going in nice, slow, and easy. I go in about, after this point, I'll go in about 125 thousandths every pass. see that the chips are flowing out nice and even and I want to see a pretty consistent chip load on each flute. That way I know each flute is doing its job equally and I'm not crooked or anything like that.
So how many passes does it take for this to happen? Well, let's see. A average pass is 125,000. And a, well, it's not exactly true, but the average 308 case and throat are uh, 2 inch 800 thousandths long. So 2.8 divided by 0.125. See, what does that come out to? Comes out to roughly 22 passes. You have to go through and do this 22 more times, or 22 times total. Well, roughly. Yeah, roughly. Thankfully, Pacific Tool Engage puts a datum mark on their reamers. should be or where all the measurements are taken from to make the reamer. And all I have to do is just keep going until the datum mark is close to the end of the barrel in this case. And then I will use headspace gauges and mics to measure the distance that I need to go yet. Okay. I've run the reamer in to getting pretty close to my datum line on my on my reamer. So now I'm going to actually use a go gauge for 308 cases, 308 base cases. They, they are uh, used for everything from 243 to 358, as long as it's based off of the um, 308 base case, case. So all I have to do is put it in here. I like to try and turn it, make sure that I'm not sitting on a chip that's left over on the inside. And that'd give me a fall for you. Again, I don't trust calipers, especially when you're trying to make sure you're only measuring to one one thousandth of an inch. So it's one inch 45 from the end of this to this front shoulder, and I've already determined by measuring the action that I need a headspace number of 9.6 or 0.967. So take those two numbers. Oh, looks like there might have been a chip in there, so I'm going to clean it all off and measure it again. One thousandth isn't a whole lot of a space, but when there's only six thousandths between go and no go on the gauges, an extra thou or two in the wrong spot, and you start over. I was sitting on another thou there. Another two thou. Okay, now between the two measurements, I've got another 76 thousandths to go. And by doing that, or to measure that, we use the tail stock. It's got 1 thousandths graduations on it. So I'm not just guessing.
clean this up, double check the measurements. Okay, so what's the next step then? Now I gotta polish the chamber. I'll chamfer the edge so it doesn't mark up people's brass and feeding. We'll get rid of this real sharp edge right here. Okay. You can see how it literally will cut fingernail. All right. Okay, and then I polish the inside of the chamber. And then I actually texture the inside of the chamber. People say that that's wrong. But I come in with a Scotch Bright pad and um, knock the actual shine off the inside of the chamber. The reason I do this is if you think that the two little lugs that hang off the back side of your bolt are what actually holds this closed, you know, this, these two little pieces of metal right here, if you think that that's what's actually holding the whole thing together when there's <coughs> 60 to 80,000 psi uh, in less than a um, well, in a couple of milliseconds. Um, if you think that's what's actually holding this together, um, it's actually a very small part. What people don't realize in a lot of cases is that when the gun goes off, the, ca the, the casing, the brass, and the reason we make it out of brass is so it can swell up and actually adhere to the inside inside of the chamber. Okay, so there's one more thing keeping it from just squeezing right out the back. You'll notice you start to have a lot of problems with guns if you're using steel cased ammunition is because there's so much bolt thrust or so much case thrust on the bolt that it starts to break things and it's because it doesn't swell up and adhere to the chamber just like brass does just for a millisecond. That's why you can't feel it when you open up the gun and pull the, pull the brass out. But during an explosion, the piece of brass actually has more to do with holding everything together than the bolt does. Granted, it wouldn't work at all if the bolt wasn't there. But if you make that absolutely just as smooth and shiny as you possibly can, you might as well be using steel casing because you you're losing things to hold it together under that violent, and it's very, very violent explosion. Okay, like I said before, we're going to come in here and polish this. This piece of 600 uh, wet dry on a wooden stick. I run it in until I feel the shoulder. I don't actually polish up on the shoulder, just the body. And that's all the more I polish it. Scotch Bright. And this is what I mean by texturing it. It just knocks the shine off of it. I'm sure there's some Bentrest shooters or Bentrest rifle makers right out there right now that are just losing their mind because I've knocked all the nice pretty shine off of it. But your brass will last longer and your gun's safe. So all that's left to do this one is flip it around, crown it, put it on the rifle, go out and test fire it. Nice.